I'm Jonathan Baker. This is a documentary of my process for making a painting using many different techniques to accomplish the following image. I incorporate various mediums and rely on both spontaneity and careful planning to create what you will see here. In this tutorial, I will show you both my process and my reasoning when attempting to create an image. This painting is called Monster Noir No. 2 and is 24 by 36 inches on a store-bought pre-stretched canvas. The painting is both an example of my fine art and will be used as an illustration for my comic book called Monster Noir with the approval of our writer David Goldberg and producer Dan Goldberg. The painting is made to resemble the pulp magazine covers and old-fashioned movie posters of the early 20th century and vaguely describes some of the events that take place in the issue. The theme is a film noir detective story set in the late 1940s featuring monsters and a damsel in distress. For the covers and interior art, I was heavily influenced by these movie and magazine covers and tried to emulate them with this painting. I preferred its ambiguity and vignettes of story like the movie posters you see here. The first step was to create a thumbnail sketch arrangement of the elements. I deliberately kept details to a minimum in order to allow for spontaneity in the design and allow what I call happy accidents to occur. The image is based very loosely on the events of the issue, but is ambiguous enough to use the image for any issue or advertising. The second step is to paint the canvas in a solid color of acrylic. I wanted to have much of this color show through the end product. My first choice was to create a torn paper or deckled look to the edges of the canvas using removable masking tape and spraying black enamel spray paint. This creates a framing effect and is reminiscent of the first Monster Noir painting I have done, thus continuing a theme. Next was to create the highly stylized claw hand. I decided to make a hard edge stencil. I took pictures of my own hand, tweaked the image in Photoshop, printed it out 10 inches wide, and traced it onto thin adhesive shelf paper you can buy in the kitchen department of supermarkets or department stores. This can be used as a substitute for airbrush frisket. It is not as tacky or retains a sharp line, but it serves as a fair stencil. I cut and placed the stencil and sprayed a dark undercoat of green enamel spray paint. I wanted to have a gnarled texture, so I used crackling texture acrylic medium over the dark green paint, then painted light green acrylic over that. Within minutes, it created a random crackling of the light green paint lending to the sinister look of the hand. This is again one of those happy accidents where I can allow unforeseen elements and events to come through the painting. I hastily decided to use another stencil. In this case, radiating lines would highlight what the hand was grasping for. An old tabletop fan was perfect for the task. To add to the chaotic dispersion of the paint, I used a strange technique for the spray paint. If you spray heavy droplets of water on a flat canvas, and then spray oil-based enamel paints on top of that. The sprayed enamel rests on top of the water droplets until the water is dry. Then the oil-based paint sticks to the canvas making a textured look. This makes for some strange and random texture that I've used in other paintings. I sprayed white and yellow enamel spray paint and the paint dried with a moderately random texture. From there, I had choices for my composition. I knew I wanted to make this painting resemble pulp magazine covers and old-fashioned movie posters, but I needed life models. While working on the hand, I decided that the only model I had handy was myself. I donned my suit, set up lights in a camera against a mirror, and tried to look like the main character from our comic. I only have a passing resemblance to our private detective, so I knew I could modify the end result with Photoshop and some creativity. I took pictures, making random poses in the time allotted by the camera. I finally came across a workable pose. The gun would then have to be modified from a BB gun to a PI snub-nosed pistol. Now I had to decide some of the elements for the final composition. In Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator, I altered and played with some of the arrangements that would work well together, as well as incorporating the title and edition info on the cover. I decided to use a better image of the female lead in the issue of the comic, so I needed another model. I found a good model from a photo in a collection of gossip magazines from the early 1950s that had expired copyrights. I used Photoshop to clean up and adjust the levels, printed them out on paper, 
and used an overhead projector to trace the images onto the canvas. I kept the female lead muted in the background and concentrated more on her being an acrylic underpainting, very vague and ghostly. She appears to be reacting to the hand, but has her own light source from her left-hand side. Next, I painted the private detective using a printout as a reference. I decided to keep the same color scheme as it would contrast heavily with the light blue of the overall canvas. I wasn't using realistic light sources in the composition, but this was a conscious choice. One main trick I like to use with some paintings is to use both acrylic and oil paints on some sections of the painting. I can sketch out sections of the painting using acrylic paint which dries quickly. When the acrylic dries, I can then paint in oils over the acrylic. Sometimes the acrylic is a wash and sometimes it is solid. I can allow the acrylic to show through the oil paint. I can take advantage of the blending techniques that oils are known for, but then I'll have a guideline of acrylic underneath in case I need to fix any mistakes. The acrylic paint can show through, making a complete image that is quicker and easier to paint. With these main sections finished, I made some snap decisions about the last of the graphics. For the comic book illustrations, I will leave some room for type or copy in case the writer and producer want to see some blurbs or statements bracketing the characters on the image. I made a hard edge graphic of Our Lady in Peril about to be snatched by the creature's hand. I rendered this with oil-based enamel paint pens, which retains a sharp line. On the previous cover of the comic, I used a trail of splattered blood to imply terror and as a texture element to guide the eye around the image, so I repeated this blood splatter on this cover. This painting is by no means the final product for the cover of one of our comics, but also serves as a part of my fine art series. A lot of my recent works is based on pulp magazine covers and old movie posters, so the large 24 by 36 inch canvas can be shown as part of an art collection and matches the rest of the paintings I have in the series. It is both an illustration to convey story and fine art in which the viewer can determine their own emotional reaction to the canvas. Without the content of it being a comic book cover, viewers must determine their own story and responses to the piece. It is both colorful and lively, but ominous and confrontational. It implies danger, but also has compelling whimsy that is approachable. It is a tawdry image, but it is not too gory or over the top. I find the contradiction very satisfying. The image may be processed more in Photoshop if it will be used as a cover of our comic book. If viewers have any questions, please feel free to contact me at www.jonathanbakerart.com. Thank you.